Hey, good morning. How you doing? Good to see you this morning. Glad that you are with us on the, this cool Sunday morning. Um, in fact, because it's cool, I want to take us back to the summer of June 2012. And there was a small thunderstorm that began in central Iowa. And over the next few hours, this storm began to grow and become massive. that it actually made its way here to Virginia. When it hit Virginia, it tore down, knocked down thousands of trees, knocked out power to about a million people, and sadly, 10 people passed away because of downed trees here in the state. Now, what was this power? Where did it come from? Was it because of the rain? Was it because of the lightning? No, it was because of the wind. Now, if you remember when that storm hit in 2012, and it wasn't just Virginia, of course, it hit many states, you know they called it a derecho. Now, that term derecho means windstorm. Now, these windstorms have sustained gusts of 58 miles per hour, and they leave a path of destruction that's at least 240 miles long. When that storm hit here in Virginia, it was doing about 87 Miles per hour. We having mic issues again? Hello? Sorry, we had mic issues first service. Exact same time. So uh, I'm going to go to the handheld, guys. Is that all right? Yes? I, I know. We have people online. That's our issue. The people online? <laughs> How many of you watched this online before you showed up here for the first time? Raise your hands right now. See, there's people online right now, and you're waiting. You need to get here next week. (laughs) All right. I wasn't very, I'm just going to be honest for a second. I wasn't really happy when that happened the first service. I'm going to have to send out an email like, hey, I'm sorry. It was was a little upset. But anyway, uh, let's just keep moving here. Kind of like a derecho, this windstorm, right? Well, when this storm hit Virginia, it was going at about 87 miles per hour. The, The wind gusts were 87 miles per hour. That's the same as a Category 1 hurricane. And so the destruction that we saw here totally makes sense. But I I want you to think about storms for a second. Where is the power in them? Like a hurricane, a tornado, a a thunderstorm, a derecho, it's in the wind, right? But, But here's the deal with the wind. We can't see it. What do we see? We see the effects of the wind. We see the limbs moving. We see the leaves blowing. We see the trash cans flying through the... And I want to take us back to a passage we read last week. We were, uh, read something that Jesus said in Matthew. And, and as I, I talked, I said, hey, the most important assets that we have in our life are our relationships. It's not our income. It's not our retirement fund. It's not our cars and our homes and our clothes. The most important assets we hold are the relationships in our lives. Jesus says this in Matthew 22, says, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So here's Jesus who says, Hey, you want to know what the most important relationship should be in your life? It should be with God. But Jesus doesn't end there, right? Jesus continues on. Jesus says in a second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. Everything in life falls under these relationships. The relationship we have with God and the relationship we have with others. And so as we began the series last week, I said, hey, one of the best things we can do to help us have a better forecast for our relationships is to look internally. And and I also told you, like, hey, we're really bad at self-evaluation. So I said, go find three people that you know, that you are close to, that you fully trust, and ask them this question. What's it like to be in relationship with me? Because, again, we're not good at saying, hey, this is where I'm struggling. But other people we know and care for us will definitely say, hey, here's what your strengths are in your relationships, but here are your weaknesses. And so from that, we can begin to understand ourselves better so that, once again, we can forecast better relationships in our lives. Well, today, we're going to continue to look at this inward peace to who we are. Because in us, there is this powerful force that many people can't see, but it definitely affects our relationships. What is this force? What is this wind in us? It's insecurity. 
for many of us, insecurity is, again, it's this powerful force. But I believe that all of us have some pockets of insecurity in us. Now, it's different for different people. Uh, For some of us, that insecurity masquerades as meekness, as compliance, as assuming blame. can even make its way into being humble and humility. We may masquerade those insecurities in humility. But for others, it goes a different direction. For others, it's this defiant behavior or it's attention seeking or or maybe it's never admitting that you're wrong. Um, If you know any narcissist in your life, you know, we look at them like, man, these people are way too confident. Well, they're not way too confident. They're actually very, very insecure. And it plays itself out in narcissism. And so all of us, I think, have some sort of pockets of insecurity in us, but it just shows itself in many different ways. Well, where does this insecurity come from? Uh, Let me just share with you a few areas, and and these are kind of like high level. There are definitely many, many more, but these are, I think, some of the most common places that our insecurity comes from. Let me share a couple of those with you here. Uh, First, insecurity comes from negative words we've been told. Oftentimes, sadly, this comes from our growing up years. Maybe as a coach, a teacher, a family member, frequently it was a parent. Parents would say, hey, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty like they are. You're not as athletic as they are. And you know what we do with those negative words? We remember them. And especially if they were said to us over and over and over again, and we began to believe them, Maybe at some point in time, your finances were such a mess you had to declare bankruptcy. Uh, maybe the, the marriage that when you, you thought was going to be perfect and everything was moving in the right direction, it ends abruptly. Like there's all these little failures in our life, and, and sometimes those are very big failures that we experience. And, and as we experience these failures, we start to question ourselves and, and who we are. And so insecurity begins to, to build up inside of us because of those failures. For others, our insecurity comes from our shame. Their decisions that we've made in our our past, their experiences that we've had, maybe at the hands of someone else in our life, and and we carry the shame with us. And I can tell you that shame is a heavy, heavy burden. And when you carry that shame, you're afraid of what other people are going to think about you. That if they, they knew what I did or they knew what I experienced, they wouldn't want to be around me. They want to, wouldn't want to spend time with me. And so these insecurities, they, they become a part of our life because of the shame that we've experienced or the shame that we carry with us on a daily basis. But if you were to take all these insecurities, and you can add your own in there, whatever that may be that you struggle with or you know other people struggle with, and you were to kind of melt them away, you're going to find that there's one thing that leads to this insecurity that we all feel. Insecurity is all about our fears. It's all about our fears. Now, when I'm talking about fear here, I'm not talking about fear of flying. I'm not talking about a fear of spiders or watching a scary movie. I'm not not talking about a fear of you go to McDonald's today and you try to figure out how to pay for number one because it's so expensive right now. I'm not talking about those kind of fears, right? I'm talking about fears of rejection or disappointing people or disapproval or, or feeling inferior to others. That's the kind of fear that I'm talking about. And that fear leads to these insecurities that we face in our lives. But that's why I love the Bible. Because when you begin to go look at Scripture and you begin to look at the stories of these people in the past, what do you see? You see two things, that as God is telling these people, hey, I'm going to use you, you see all kinds of fear in them, which leads to this insecurity. And so that should really give us a lot of hope for our own lives, right? Because God's like, I'm still going to use you even though you have this fear and even though you have this insecurity. Two of my favorite examples are in the Old Testament. One of them is a guy named Moses. Um, Moses is chosen by God to do this incredible, incredible thing. But, you know, we, we look at Moses and we, we think Moses is like this, this strong, really secure and, and powerful and confident leader. But if you read his story, you find that he was really far from that. 
Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 says, But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. Now, if you know Moses' story, for 40 years he lives in Egypt. He lives in the Pharaoh's house. He's got the best of the best. And then one day he sees a, a fellow Hebrew that's a slave is being beaten by an Egyptian. And so he jumps in, he kills the Egyptian. He feels like he figures out, hey, I'm in, I'm in deep trouble. And so he runs away. And for the next 40 years, he lives as a runaway. He, he is in a different place and away from Egypt, trying to protect himself. At the age of 80, God shows up I'm like, hey, Moses, I got something I need you to do. I need you to lead my people out of Egypt, out of slavery, into freedom. And we see how Moses responds here, right? Moses has got all of these reasons why he can't do what God has asked him to do. Look at verse 11. Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Hear, do not hear, see or do not see. Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. It's almost like God's saying, hey, Moses, you know what? You're kind of right. You, you don't have all the leadership qualities that you need, but you got an ace up your sleeve like you got me. And I'm going to take you, and I'm going to lead you, and I'm going to make this happen. And so this is what I need you to do. And, and how does Moses respond? Verse 13, but Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Here's this guy that God has chosen to do this incredible thing, and Moses is like, not me. Like there's got to be like somebody else out there, some other person that you can choose, God, but just make sure it's not me. What do we see here? We see his fears. Like we can sense these insecurities that, that Moses has. But it's not just Moses. We see this again with a guy named Gideon. I love the story of Gideon. We find his story in the book of Judges. The Israelites aren't doing what God asked them to do. And so God's like, all right, well, if you're not going to do what I've asked you to do, I'm going to let the Midianites come in and take over. And so that's what happens. The Midianites come out here into Israel, and they, they take over the land. Now the Israelites are hiding up in the mountains. They're starving to death. And so then they're like, well, you know what? We probably should have a better relationship with God. And so they go back to God like, God, we're sorry. We want to change this. Can you help us out? And God has a plan of how to do this, and it, it works through this guy named Gideon. Judges 6, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at, at Ophrah which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. This angel shows up to where Gideon is, and I love these words from, from this angel. The angel says, hey, mighty warrior, or mighty hero here. Some translations say mighty warrior. What is this mighty hero what is this mighty warrior doing? Well, you know, he's out and he's trying to build this guerrilla army so that they can go and fight the Midianites because this is who he's supposed to be. This is the life he's supposed to live, right? No, he's hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. Now, why is Gideon there? Because he's like everybody else. Gideon is afraid. But look at Gideon's response to the angel in verse 13. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? I mean, didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Look at his response here. He doesn't say thank you. Right? He doesn't say, you know what, I'm honored. I can't believe God wants to use me. How, how can I, I, I serve God, his response is a lot of, oh, we're struggling. Why is God letting this happen to us? Where is God in this? Look at verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Here's God who tells Gideon, hey, Gideon, you are my dude, right? I have chosen you. You're the one. And I love that last line there. I 
am sending you. I have chosen you, Gideon, to go and make this happen. And Gideon's ready, right? No, look at what Gideon says. We see his insecurities again in verse 15. But, Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. You ever been around an insecure person? It's tough, isn't it? And many times you feel like you're walking on eggshells. You, you feel like you have to watch every little thing that you do. And you definitely have to make sure that the words that you say are the right words because you're not quite sure how that insecure person is going to respond to what you say. And so maybe you've been around an insecure boss or an insecure uh, coworker or family member. Maybe you've been around an insecure spouse. And, you know, it is really hard to be around insecure people. It's hard to follow insecure leaders. That's kind of the way we look at it. It's hard to help people who are insecure. It's hard to sometimes even love those people who are insecure. I read this about Gideon, and I'm thinking, I don't know if I'd want to be around this guy because of these insecurities that he has. Now, what kind of makes me laugh here is it feel like as I read this part is the Gideon's looked at the Israelite rankings. And as he's looked at the tribes and families, he's noticed that, hey, my family is ranked last here in this ranking that's come out. Right. It's uh, it's college basketball season because for me, college football season ended like four weeks ago. Um, <laughs> But it's college basketball season. This is the first week of college basketball. The first two games have been played. But there's already rankings out, right? They got the top 25. Now, what you're going to find over the next few weeks and months is those rankings will change because teams are going to play each other and play their games, and somebody's going to be worse than everybody expected, and someone's going to be better. And So by the end of the year, we're going to have a pretty good idea of what those rankings are. Now, when I read this, I kind of my mind goes there, right? I'm thinking, again, Gideon's looked at the Israelite rankings, and he's looked at his family. He's like, man, we've had a tough year. Like, it's been really hard. You know, we've had some, a few injuries going on. Grandpa, you know, pulled a muscle. And uh, sis is, you know, having a hard time making that shot. And um, we got some infighting going on. We got to kind of work on. So we're ranked last in our clan. And, oh, by the way, <laughs> in our family, I'm actually the worst player. I blew my Achilles last year. I'm trying to do the Aaron Rodgers. Incredible things happen. You are my leader. And we read this, and all I see are all of Gideon's fears and all these insecurities. Just like I see with Moses, his fears and his insecurities. And the same fears and insecurities that we probably see in ourselves. As I was writing this message this week, like I realized something that um, I actually wasn't writing this message for you. And I didn't realize this till like Thursday that, uh, that I was writing this message for me. Because if I'm honest with you, I have struggled with insecurities almost my whole life. Now, like many of you, I'm really good at masking those insecurities, but they're there. And I can tell you that those insecurities, they affect who I am, and they definitely affect the relationships with people around me. And so as I was thinking about this and I was talking to today about these fears and, and insecurities, I, I thought to myself, you know what, I'm just going to come, come out and just kind of share with you a couple of areas that I experience this and I feel this, specifically in, in my role as as a pastor here at The Journey. Um, for all intents and purposes, The Journey is the healthiest it's ever been as a church. Every Sunday morning here in the fall, we were averaging about 550 people here over the course of two services. Parking lots full. Uh, kids' classes are, are filled to the brim. Our teen ministry is, is booming. We've got more people in groups right now than we've ever had here at The Journey. We've got more leaders in place than we've ever had here at The Journey. Uh, over the last four years, they've been our best financial years ever here at The Journey. And, yeah, that even includes the COVID year. At the end of this service today, we're going to see the 26th baptism of 2023. And the year's not even over with, which is huge for us. And, and I can look at that, and, and from my position here, I'm kind of like, and you would think the same thing, like, this is amazing. Let's go. God's doing incredible things. 
And then I hear from you, and you, you give me encouraging words, and you talk about how, how God is using this place to work in your life and how you've built relationships with But there are some Monday mornings I wake up, and it's the day that I'm thinking I'm going to get a call from our board who says, hey, we want to move in a different direction. Now, you may be thinking, uh-oh, there's problems there. Is that why you said no? We've got a great board, a great team. I love them. They love me. We trust each other. But it's those fears and insecurities that I have so deep inside of me that sometimes, even though things may be going great, there's this peace in me that's just thinking maybe tomorrow is it. Or something else that uh, I experience is I stand up here in front of you most Sundays of the year to speak. And, and as I do that, you know, over the past week, I've put quite a few hours into prepping for this time with you. And in fact, I probably spend about 20 hours every single week prepping for a message on a Sunday. Now, this includes uh, studying and prayer and research and, and writing and rewriting and re-rewriting, Right. Like, this is my fifth draft on this message today, okay? Final draft, by the way, but it's my fifth draft. <laughs> there's been as high as eight or nine, which uh, those have been rough weeks for me. But, um, but then there's practice. Like, I don't want to get up here and act like I don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, before I even step on stage for the very first service, I've done this out loud, fake audience in front of me, right, at least four times, if not six times, because I just want to know what I'm doing. I want to be prepped for this moment with you. But you know what goes to my head way too often? It's like, do they even understand what I'm saying? <laughs> right, did that even make sense? I mean, and it made sense when I was saying it to myself in front of a room of nobody, but now that I'm saying this, I'm not, like, I'm not sure that makes sense, or why did I put that there? Are they going to be able to follow along? And so there's all these, like, questions and insecurities that are going through my head as I'm, as I'm talking to you on a Sunday. I hope they don't look that up on the Internet because I'm not quite sure that's actually true. <laughs> but I did a little research, and if Wikipedia says it, it must be true, right? And so there's all these kind of questions that are there. Am I going to say something today that's going to offend someone, that's going to hurt their feelings, and they're never going to come back? And I'm going to lose that connection. I'm going to lose that relationship. Now, after today, you may not come back, <laughs> right? You're like, I want my pastor to be confident and full of, you know, and all this stuff. But what I will tell you is I am doing my best to work through those fears and to work through those insecurities that are in me. Because I understand that even though you may not be able to see them, like it, it's, it's something that is, is inside of me. And it's affecting me, and it's affecting the relationships that I have with other people. But how do we deal with these insecurities that we have? Now, I tell you all that because I'm not looking for pity, okay? And I'm not looking for affirmation. I tell you that because I truly believe we can work on these insecurities that we have in our life. And so let me share some of those insecurities uh, or ways that we can deal with insecurity that we experience. Here's the first thing I would say. Identify what triggers you. My guess is when those fears come, when that insecurity hits, there's some reason that it, it comes your way. There's some trigger in your life. And the best thing you can do is start to record what that trigger is. And so if you experience one of those moments where you're triggered and, and those insecurities begin to kick in, hey, write it down. Put it on your phone. And just keep doing this because here's what you're going to see. Over time, if those insecurities are still there, you're going to see this pattern. And as you look at this pattern, you're probably going to find it's the same thing that triggers you over and over and over again. And if you understand those triggers, then you can probably get help for those. But we need to understand what triggers us to these insecurities that we feel and experience. Second thing I would say is focus on the positive. I've shared this data with you before, and I've checked it on the Internet quite a few times. You can check it if you want to and let me know. But 77% of what we think is negative. 77%. Now think about that. It may even be higher than that, right? Because our world is negative. Everything we hear is negative. Everything we read is negative. Everything on social media is negative. And oh, by the way, have you had a conversation with somebody lately? Like, how many people have you been around and you've left like, that is the most positive person I've ever been around? It's not that way, right? 
Why? Because we share all this negative stuff in our life. And so it is it any wonder that all we think about are negative things. And so that means that we begin to look at our weaknesses. We, we begin to look at the things that we're not good at. We look at the cultural norms and like, hey, here's the things that cultural norms say are the norms. And when we don't fit inside those boundaries, that becomes our negative too. Begin to focus on the positives in your life. Begin to focus on the strengths that you have been given. Begin to focus on those encouraging words. Look, if you get encouraging words from someone, you got to hold on to those words. Because who knows, the next time you may hear encouraging words from somebody. But hold on to that. Let those begin to kind of seep into who you are. We've got to learn to get away from our negative thinking and focus on the positive. The third thing I would say is get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Or I don't like that this church did this. And, and so there's all these uncomfortable moments. Now, next week, we're going to talk about conflict. So come back. All right. It's going to be great. Very positive series we're working on here. We're going to talk about conflict because that's another big, important thing that we have to deal with. But I am learning how to be comfortable with the uncomfortable, which means for me, I am learning to set boundaries. And so if I have these boundaries and I, for me in this role specifically, if I feel like they're God honoring boundaries, man, I, I got to I got to go down that path. I got to go down that road because that's the place God is leading me to. Which means for me, again, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Getting comfortable with those uncomfortable conversations or, or moments or, or meetings. And, and maybe for you it's the same thing. Because I'm a people pleaser. I told you this before. And most people in ministry are people pleasers. We love to help people. We have a ton of compassion for people. Which also means there's a lot of uncomfortable moments for us. But learning to be comfortable in that. Man, it's so powerful, and it's so freeing, and I truly believe it's what God has called us to, to be uncomfortable or to be comfortable in those uncomfortable moments and see where God is leading us. The fourth thing I would say, and I talk about this a lot here at The Journey, is get counseling. Uh, we can talk through all of these next steps here or these ideas, but having a professional Walk alongside of you as you go through these fears and anxieties. One of the best things you can do. I've shared with you before. I go every other week. I meet with Sarah, and Sarah's like, hey, what do you want to talk about? And I'm like, I don't know. And then for the next 55 minutes, I just blah, all this stuff just comes out, right? And as I'm talking to her, she's like, hey, what about this? Or you thought about this? Or, you know, how would you handle this situation? And I'm finding over time that it's helping me take the right next steps in my life. And it's because I've got a professional who's looking at me, who sees those fears, who sees those insecurities, and in helping me walk through that. That's why here at The Journey, we set aside funding to help pay for counseling. Like if you say, hey, I want to get counseling, but I can't afford it. Or, hey, I want to get counseling, but I can't pay what it costs. Hey, that should never be an excuse. And so here at The Journey, we put it in our budget to say, we're going to budget this much money so we can help people who need professional help. And that's why we have that unique partnership with Safe Harbor Christian Counseling. Now, we know they might not be the best fit for everybody, but what we're finding is for most people, it's a great connection, a great partnership, and people are getting the, the healing they need from those fears and insecurities. If that's you, there's an email address up there on the screen, office at thejourneynova.org. You can email us. That's Robin. Robin will get you connected with Safe Harbor. We'll work through any financial concerns you may have because we want to see people get over these fears in their life and move beyond those insecurities so we can be who God has created us to be. And so maybe for you, it's finding time for counseling. As we kind of take all of these next steps, I truly believe the most important one is building your confidence in God. We've talked about this word insecurity this morning. Well, insecurity means a lack of confidence. The Latin origin of the word confidence is actually the word confide. Cone means with and fide means faith. So confidence means with faith. So that means that insecurity means without faith, that when we, when we are insecure in our lives, that we lack 
faith. Well, who do we lack faith in? Partly we lack faith in ourselves. And a lot of that comes from the things that we talked about a little bit earlier. But I also believe it means we lack faith in God. That we have to be reminded that we are on this journey, not alone, but we are on this journey with God. And these fears and these insecurities that we struggle with, you know what? They're not a gift that comes from God. I love what, what Paul writes to his student Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. I got the wrong Timothy in here. One of the Timothys, right? 2 Timothy. Paul writes this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Again, this fear that we have, these insecurities, that aren't a gift from God. What is a gift from God is the power, the love, and the self-discipline. This power comes from what we just talked about in our last series. We talked about the Holy Spirit. That when we follow God, that we are given this, this gift. We follow Jesus, we're given this gift of the Holy Spirit. And so as the Holy Spirit works in us, it does tremendous work in us if we allow it to. To guide us, to lead us hey, to strengthen us, to take away that fear, to help us work through those insecurities. There's power through the Holy Spirit in our lives to move us beyond that fear and insecurity that we experience in our life. But then there's that love. This love is the unconditional love that God has for you and for me. And, and this unconditional love is so powerful that, that God sent Jesus to this earth to live to die, and then so God could bring Jesus back to life, to give us hope for now and eternity. And you know what we may need when it comes to those fears and insecurities that we, we feel deep down? Maybe what we need is to be reminded that we are unconditionally loved. Now, maybe in our experiences in the past, we didn't, we didn't have that unconditional love from people that should have given that to us. But maybe that's the reminder we need is that God's unconditional love is the, is the best, most powerful love that we can experience. But in the end, there's that self-discipline, right? Like we can't get to where we need to go unless we actually take the steps forward. That we begin to work through these fears, that we begin to work through these insecurities. And you know what? For some of us, it might take a long time to do that. But in the end, if we do that, you and I will be so much healthier. We'll be in a better place. But better yet, a time, thank you for this place. Thank you for a reminder of your love for us. I know that many of us struggle with these insecurities, God, but you did not give us a gift, a spirit of fear. You, you gave us a a spirit of confidence that we can have in and through you. And may we, may we grasp it. May we hold on to it. May we live that out for you. God, lead us, direct us, and guide us through your spirit so we can have that confidence that will begin to change who we are. And then, God, through that, will change the relationships in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.